Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Sandy Alnock and I'm an artist who works in a number of mediums and I love to teach. And today is a special day because I've got a real time watercolor video for you. In this, we're going to be painting a snowy scene. And you are welcome to stop this video right now, go down to the doobly-doo and find the list of supplies if you haven't got them already and get your paper out. You can work in a sketchbook or you can work full size, whichever way you would like to do, and download the photo and print it out so you're ready to roll. I will have the photo on the screen though, so if you just wanna grab some paints and join me, that would be wonderful as well. I don't do real-time videos very often because it takes so long and I don't know what to keep blathering for that much time. So there are gonna be some sections in here when it's just painting more and more and more branches you can watch that and I'm going to have some music on, but I will have some pauses in my voiceover during those portions. If you're watching this during the premiere of this video, be sure to ask your questions in chat because I will be there live, but I'll also answer questions in the comments after the video is up as well. And we might even have a discussion section over in Art Venture, which is the place where I have a community of artists on Mighty Networks, and you're welcome to join me over there as well. All right, are you ready to paint? Let's get started. This painting is based on a photograph that was sent to me by some Facebook friend years ago. I dragged them all into a folder and I didn't name this one for who to credit it with. Sorry about that, whoever belongs to the photo, but I'm cropping in on it. I wanted to paint a horizontal, but I also wanted to get rid of some of the extraneous things that were in the picture. Lots of those trees at the top were not important and I wanted to focus on that highlight in the distance, that very white place in the center on the ground. And that cutting out that foreground really helps to focus on that. And I did do a value study already. If you're painting small, then your first one might be your value study. And I was really focusing on how light and how dark each one of the colors is. And paying attention to whether they're more bluish or more brownish in tone because we can mix out of the two colors we're using, the bluish and brownish tones. The first pass is what we'll begin with. And the goal of this pass for me is to get rid of all of the areas that are not pure white. When we're done, this whole painting is gonna feel like it's white and snowy, but I need that spot in the middle to be really white. And so I've drawn two horizontal lines one is the bottom of the gray trees in the distance, and one is the bottom of those little bushes, the bluish bushes that you can see. And I'm gonna mix three wells of color. And I'm gonna to try to mix a good amount of each color. Now this is the blue for the sky, but I don't want pure blue out of the, out of the tube or out of the pan, because that's kind of boring. So I'm gonna drop in just a slight, just a tiny amount of transparent red oxide, or you can use a um, burnt sienna if you'd like. And that gives it just a bit of grayishness because you can see that blue in the sky is very pale, but it's also not really blue, blue, blue. Next, I'm gonna mix up some cool gray in the middle. And when you're mixing colors like this, you're gonna mix a um, an amount of blue and an amount of whatever the brown color is you're using, and you're gonna keep going until it, the color starts to shift to what you want it to be. If you want it to be more brown, then keep going till it's brown. And if it gets too brown, then put in more blue. If it gets too blue, put in more brown. I mean, just mix back and forth. But I want you to have a cool and a warm gray mix. And the um, brush that I'm gonna use is gonna be this Casineo brush. Just the biggest brush you've got is, is good for this because you want a lot of water and a lot of color on the, the paper. My desk is tilted, so you'll see all of my paint go down to the bottom of my, my mixing wells. 
um, so that I get some gravity playing along here. But I'm going to start with the sky. I mixed it very, very thin, so I added more water to it because we don't want much color up in here. And the darker color is right around the white trees. And then I'm going to take clean water and just rinse the brush well and drag that over so that I have the, the edge of that blue just melt off on the left-hand side. And I know the picture's up there right now, but there's really nothing there other than water behind the picture. So I'll leave that for the moment. And then I'm going to start joining some color on either side because I want to leave that white outline of the trees in the, the distance. I want to try to leave that white, if at all possible. The trees on the right-hand side, there's going to be more gray in there. So I can start dropping in one of the bluish grays because that's going to be over on the right-hand side. And there is some warmish gray in there too. So you can, you know, add in some of that. The fact that these are mixes means we're going to get an kind of ongoing mix of the two colors. And I'm just going to go back and forth between some bluish and some more traditional grayish and then into some of the warmer kind of colors and just make that right hand side a bunch of trees. We're going to do the same thing on the left hand side. I'll take the picture away for the moment. And this is just joining all of these these wash areas around the painting so that they have very soft edges before we start moving into detail on top of them. And if there's any areas you want to have a hard edge, now is the time to create that hard edge. And I'm going to just keep working my way around the rest of the painting to put enough color in so that we, we knock back all of that, that white, that white paper, and let that focus area in the center be the focus. Because if, if there's white everywhere else, that's not going to appear as white. Everything looks white or looks black or looks whatever it is compared to the other colors that are around it. The snow is the most intense solid blue color. So I'm going to put that in now. You can add some more in later, but if you can get your snow in at the right color now and not add another layer later on, you're going to be better off. For the trees in the distance, I want to paint them negatively around the bushes that are in the, the section right in front of them. And notice that I took my brush and I kissed the edge of some of the dripping paint that was coming down from the sky still. And I just kissed it so it would pull that color down into the trees and not collect there because you don't want to have a whole line of color around the outside edge of that, that white tree. And next up is going to be the little bushes. And those are a much bluer kind of gray. So I'm going to just throw in some light color here. Now remember that watercolor dries lighter than you expect. So don't be afraid to put more color in. But I did paint this another time in between the sketch and this, and I overdid it. So if you overdo it, it's okay. It's possible to overdo it. But when I put my sketch right out in front of me so that I could really see what I was aiming for, I was better able to get the right values. And I dropped in a little extra of the gray color hoping to create some distance between the far trees and those foreground blue bushes. But that didn't quite work out. When I had it completely dried, and you want this completely, totally dry, no warbles in the paper. Because if the, if the paper is still warpy, then that means it's not completely dry and you're gonna, your brush is going to struggle going up and down above it. I'm trying to mix a color that I can put into those trees in the distance, and I want it to have enough color in it that it starts to create that separation, but I'm going to put it just at the bottom and put enough of the color in there that I can then use a clean brush to start pulling that color upward like I did before, but now I can control that hard edge a little bit more. So even if I didn't succeed in creating that separation earlier when I had made the that that wash area, 
and tried dropping color in, I can actually do that now. So when you start out with really light layers, you can always add a little bit more in there. And since I have some of this gray color, I'm just gonna throw a little more here and there into the trees. Don't try to put it everywhere. Leave yourself some open space. Leave some, some white open areas. And I'm also, as you may be seeing here, I'm not worried about replicating, okay, there's gonna be one big tree in the middle and then a short one off to the left. I'm getting a general angle of the trees cascading downward, not stressed out about trying to make sure it looks exactly like the photo. I'm changing things from the photo. The white area in the middle, that white snow, is much wider than it is in the photograph. I've added some more bushes off to the right-hand side so that I can have a larger area there. I still want my focal point area on the left-hand side. I don't want it dead center, but I'm creating that pathway going off toward the left in my painting, so, so that'll be fine. Now, once this is dry, and if your paint there is too wet, then you'll have to stop and dry it. But if it's you know dry enough that you can paint on, then you can use a small brush, and this one is a number four, to paint in some of the tree trunks. And with tree trunks, they don't go always particularly vertical. They sometimes skip, so you can make almost hashed lines at different lengths of each of the sections, make a few of the branches off, off to the side, and I'm using a baby wipe to dab off some of the color. If you end up with too much color, if your paint is too thick, then just dab that off. Now for the little bushes, there's the one bush that has a very something dark at the base of it, and I wanted to have that contrast of something dark next to the white snow. But I also want to have some kind of lacy branches in there to mimic the ones that are in the trees in the background, and got out my uh, long needle brush, which I should have gotten out for those trees in the first place in the background, but I didn't. And just going to make some little branches in here. Uh, the more loose and calligraphic you can make your marks on things like trees and trunks and bushes, the better. And by calligraphic, if you think about each person having a, a handwriting, like you've, you've got a handwriting that's different than everybody else's handwriting. And you can call it bad, you can call it good, you can call it whatever. But your handwriting is unique to you. And the way that you use your brush to create things like this is unique to you. And it's a great exercise to just take a whole page, if you have a, a back of an old painting, and just practice making tree branches. Just over and over and get your hand used to making those very light, delicate motions with a brush. It doesn't have to be a liner brush like this because this isn't an expensive brush, but do it with a small brush, do it with a fat brush. See what brushes of yours take uh, different paints, different mixtures of paints in different ways because sometimes you'll have a particular thickness that works better with one brush than another. And it's, 
important to figure that out so that when you get to a point like this where you're going to be adding in branches, that you know how thick or thin to mix the pigment. And this brush I know fairly well because I've used it a lot and the mixture that I have going is, is one that works well for it. And it took some practice to get to the point of knowing what that mixture should be. Now the collection of gray that's at the bottom of that tree base, that, that those trees in the background, was bothering me because that wouldn't be normally how you would see just a whole collection of pigment. That didn't look intentional. It looked like ink just collected there and dried that way. So I used a baby wipe to just lift it. It's, it's legal to lift color after you've painted it on there. So if you get something that didn't quite work well, then lift that off. When you're working with really pale washes and pale layers like this, very easy to lift color back off. I'm going to show you one of a couple approaches that you can use for painting trees like this. And I've had different teachers of mine teach me different ways. And I'm just going to show you both. So you can decide which one works better for you. And one would be to draw the branches in first. And when I say draw the branches, what I do mean is drawing them with your brush. There are people who think that painting means you don't have to draw because you're just painting, but no, you're drawing, you're drawing with paint. So I've added on now some more bluish paint in a lighter mixture. So I've added more water to it and I'm using the side of my brush to make all of the, the clusters of snow and branches on the tree. Don't make it so thick and so solid that there's no air coming through leave some openings, but also don't leave it looking like it's polka dotted either. It may look like I'm practically stippling with this brush, but I'm not. I'm laying the brush down so I get some areas that are dense and some areas that are less dense. And you get a variety that way and the tree looks more realistic. The color that I'm using here even though there's this is snow on branches, notice that it's a darker gray than the, the color of the sky. Yes, snow can be darker than the sky. It is possible. And a value study is what's going to tell you that when you start painting from any reference. If you start looking at the value of things and not just the color, don't think only about is that a, a green tree or a bluish tree? Think about, is it darker or lighter? And the way that you can tell that is by squinting. Squinting often will show you the values because you can see which areas show up when you're squinted. And uh, you can change the shapes of some of the, the bunches of trees as well. You don't have to leave them all exactly as they are in a photograph. So mine will adapt in various ways from that. Now I've moved the picture over to the right so you can watch the painting here. And this time, instead of drawing the branches first, I'm drawing the, the clusters of leaves on the trees and the snow first. And then I can put the branches in later. Either way works. Sometimes it depends on the picture that you're working with and sometimes just on whether or not you mixed up a color that's good for branches or a color that's good for tr tree trunks. Sometimes I just use what happens to have come out in the mix. And notice this color is warmer. There's a, a warmer tone to it and it's even darker than the trees that we just painted on the right hand side. So the left is darker. The reason the left is darker is because they're backlit. The sun is over on the left-hand side. So none of these branches are getting any of that sun on them. On the right-hand side, there's some sun sneaking in, kind of cascading around and bouncing around, but there's much less of it on this, this side.
as I'm moving down to the bottom, I'm just going to let it morph and, and get amorphous because I'll add more detail in that section in the next pass. And it's helpful to think through your passes and what you're going to paint in each section so that you kind of have an idea where you're headed. That's going to tell you whether or not you should stop at a certain section or whether or not you need to paint in all the detail in an area because when you try to paint it in later, you might have trouble doing so. This tree is much more blue than the other trees that are in there, in the, the whole picture. So I'm mixing a more intense kind of blue, still looking at the value of that compared to the value of the other trees that I've already painted. And then working on the color once I determine, is this lighter, is this darker? And then trying to leave a few areas of much lighter color, but by comparison, as I drop in some thicker pigment that has more pigment than water in it than my previous mixes, then I can start varying the color in that tree, just dropping that in while it's wet. There is a strong shadow coming out from that particular tree, and just one stroke, make that as simple a stroke as you can if you decide to add that in there. If you don't feel confident, that's not going to be a deal breaker in your painting. The section I'll be working on now is a place that I've basically added to my painting. Remember I made it wider so that I could make a landscape orientation painting out of this. And that means I'm going to have a different collection of trees on the right hand side. I'm going to try to keep the same basic values, but I'm at the point where I'm not really looking at my photograph for this section. I'm not trying to follow it because it's going to mess me up if I try because it's not not correct to the scale of what's here. And that's okay. You're allowed to adapt. Did anybody ever tell you that? I've joined now that right-hand side with just kind of amorphous blobby strokes. I'll add more detail to it later. But I also decided I wanted to add more color into the snow. Just a few strokes to indicate a bit of motion in the snow, that there's just a little bit more going on. Very pale color. If you don't feel like doing this, you, you've got good snow down there, feel free to skip that portion. For me, the third pass is the one where the detail comes in. And if you need a fourth and a fifth pass, then you're probably overdoing it. So I'll just tell you that now, but you can do a third pass in several phases if you need to, because a third pass can be done, you know, tree by tree. We're just adding small details. We're not adding big swooping tone changes to the painting at this point. The smaller brushes are usually going to be better in this, this pass since there's detail and thicker mixtures of pigment and less water so that you get a little stronger pigment. 
Now I started in with my number four brush to make some tree trunks. I noticed in the photograph, there were some really nice dark uh, tree trunks in that far section. And I, I wanted to have that kind of strong detail. So I'm adding it to just a few of the tree trunks. And you can add that in a small brush, in a big brush, and you can add extra ones if you didn't add enough before. And if you're only watching this and you haven't painted yet, then feel free to add less early and you can add more of those details now and not, not be caught up in that detail early on because then you can decide later just how much detail you need in those trees. But notice that they are still really soft, but there's just a few strong lines there in the bush as well. I've moved the photo over to the right hand corner since I'm going to be jumping around the painting, adding lots of branch work and that sort of thing in this section. And you'll get lots more music because there's going to be a lot of areas where <laughs> it'll just be nothing to explain, just branches, branches, branches. So one of the keys for making branches that look very natural is to hold your brush back far and away from the head of the brush that's going to give your, yourself the opportunity to draw with your arm rather than draw with your wrist or with your fingers. If you're holding the brush down close to the brush head, then you're going to be treating it like a pencil. And that's not how branches grow. Branches are not very carefully delineated as if by a pencil. They're just kind of wild things growing in all kittywampus directions. When you have major branches, don't make them at the same angles because Mother Nature doesn't grow trees that all have a 42 degree angle for all of the branches. So they're going to go different directions. There's some branches that are going to curve down instead of up, or they're going to come in from an area that you can't see where the, the branch is coming from, but it'll make it look more natural if you can make that branch look as though it's coming from off the screen somewhere. It's coming from a different tree. And if you're working from a reference, just look at those not for specific branches and like you don't have to draw in every one of those branches, but look at them for the character of the branches. My apologies for this section that gets fuzzy. That was where my camera was focusing in my hand. Just gets in the way right there. But I'm using the liner brush, which helps me to be able to lift up and, and press down with the brush and be able to get different widths from this one brush within one stroke. Another tip for drawing branches and tree trunks. If you're trying to make a line that goes from point A to point B, don't let your vision follow the line. Don't watch where your brush is going. Watch where your brush is headed. It's like when you're driving a car, you don't want to look in the ditch because you will end up driving into the ditch. You want to look on the road and you're keeping your eyes way far ahead of you where you're going. And that's going to help you to be able to make branches that end in the right place. If you want your branch to end in a particular spot, look at the spot you want it to end. And that will make a huge difference. And so now... This is the, the place where lots of people have the most fun is putting in all this detail. Don't go overly crazy. Stop yourself regularly and say, have I done enough? And if you still want to do more, you can, but just keep stopping yourself and saying, do I need to do this? Do I need more? And sometimes you'll be shifting from an area where you're going to want more brownish colors in your tree branches and then other times you can switch to something more bluish and I like to mix both of them and it, it gives a, a little more depth into the painting because the colors are shifting. You can also shift the value of each of those lines by the paint mixture. If you want very light lines then use more water. You can also dab off some color but make them make the branches all unique so that they feel like they're all made by mother nature not by a machine
for some of your trees, if they came out lighter than you wanted or expected, or you just want more intensity, you can go in after adding your branches and add in some clusters of dark places. And you can use thicker pigment. You can use less pigment. You can use some water to soften some of that out. You can even spray bottle over an area to get some soft blends going. Adding so much to that tree made it darker than I was ready for. So since I had used very thin pigment, I was able to actually lift that up real easily. So some of those things you can test out by just putting down a few strokes and it, see what it looks like. And then if it's too much, just lift it back up. To create separation between trees that are in the foreground and trees that are behind, you can add more washes of color into the tr trees in the distance so that you are doing some negative painting around the trees that are in front of them. The photo reference for this is fairly nondescript in how this bank of snow ends, how it morphs into the flat snow from all of the scrub brush down here. And I'm working from my experience as a painter in what little weeds might look like, that sort of thing. So I'm just going to be adding some darkness down here because this is going to help to frame my painting as well. I'm aiming at getting the viewer to walk into the painting and aim for the light. That's where I want them to look. And the more I can make this front area nondescript and darker and not really carefully delineated, it's going to help them to move past that quickly because I want them to enter the painting, not get stuck on, oh my goodness, you painted the most beautiful bush right there. So I'm not going to stress out about trying to make the bush perfect. I'm just going to aim to make those areas darker. And I'll add some more detail to that in a little bit. This tree is getting a lot richer color in this pass, specifically for the reason that 
it's not darker than the tree on the right hand side and it needs to be in order for the light and the shadow to read properly so i'm going over top of the painting that i'd already done but i'm doing so while leaving some of the lighter gray showing and don't cover all of it let some of it show through because that's going to give you the depth and the little bit of light that is shining on those branches is going to come through because you're going to have multiple grays in that tree. You could do the same thing on the tree on the right hand side to add more to it, but just be careful because you want that tree to stay lighter than the one in the foreground. And you don't want the foreground one to have to go black in order to read because then it's going to not look as much like snow. It's going to be more difficult if you have to go really, really dark. That's why kind of assessing the values over the whole painting is important to know where your darks and your lights need to be and how much of a midtone you need on each section to keep them reading correctly. At this point in the painting, I was thinking about trying to keep the left and the right hand corners different from each other. My instinct was just to put the same scrub brush down there on the left hand side, but if they're identical, then it looks like Mother Nature didn't grow it. It was just manufactured somehow by something else. So I'm going to put more on one side than the other. I'm using different color on one side than the other. I'm going to allow more of these taller grasses to come up on the left hand side. This is going to give the viewer the feeling that they're walking into this scene and they're coming around a curve perhaps where they're walking past these grasses. And when I can give them a little bit darker, a little more contrast in them, that's going to pull all that forward and it lightens the background by contrast because it's just got much more pigment in it, much darker values. I'm going to add a little bit of dark onto the right hand side, but I want to keep the character of it different than the left so that I don't end up with just something repeating on both the left and the right hand side. And remember that grasses, when they're in snow, can often just end up sometimes grow out of the snow as single blades. They don't necessarily have to be part of a cluster. So you can add just single blades of grass, which adds a little realism to it as well. Now, in order to add the splatters, I've dried the whole painting completely because if I add splatters while it's wet, my splatters won't end up looking clear and crisp. So if you want a more soft look, then you can do it while it's wet. If you're using nice wet pigment to splatter with as well, you can wipe it off of the other areas where you don't want the splatter. So if you don't want it on your snow in the middle, you can remove it just using a baby wipe, but just do it right away. If you're using a phthalo blue or any kind of staining color, be super careful when you're doing any kind of splattering because that's going to stain the paper. You don't want to end up using something like that that's going to stain. 
but I'm using the colors that I've already got in my painting to create the color that I'm going to spatter from. And I'm going to use the mixture that is perfect for my brush to do spattering with. Now I'm going to add something that I'm not positive was the best thing to add, but in case you wanted to add a path into a painting, I thought I'd include that as part of this video. I'm going to make a path that goes down in between this whole snowy bank area. And when you're doing this, make it a zigzag and the zigzag should have kind of points on either side. You can also skip some spots, let the snow come up and over it. This could also be a creek, and if you're painting a creek, this is a great way to add the creek at the end after you get everything else painted. So it, it could be a creek could be seen that way. A friend of mine saw this painting and she was sure it was a creek after I thought it was a path. But you're going to have darker color in the shaded areas than you're going to have in the distance. So when I get to this part way out here in the snow, in the the open area, that's going to be very light. I deliberately didn't put really dark color in the foreground section of this path though, because I didn't want the viewer to get stuck there. If I put too much dark in the front, I was worried that that would cause a blockage of some kind. So I left the darker color just at the end of the snow, dark snow area so that I could kind of pull the viewer toward that because in a painting and a drawing, whatever your art piece is, the focal point that's natural for the viewer, they may not know anything about your painting, the most natural place for them to look and spend time is wherever the lightest lights are next to the darkest darks. And so you want to pay attention to that when you're creating any extra elements, make sure you have some darks leading into your lights and surrounding your lights in some way, not as an outline, but just having those juxtaposed next to each other draws attention from the viewer. I love this painting. I really enjoyed the process and all that I learned about value from it. And my favorite part is just that the focal point is centered and yet off to the left just slightly so that the viewer is carried into the picture and, and just all of those values draw you to that center section. If you've painted along with me, I would absolutely love to see your work. Please do share it on social media and tag me if you would like to, or you could join the Art Venture community and share it over there. We have a whole thread full of everyone's versions of this painting, so you can see what other people have done as well. I'm going to put a link in the doobly-doo to that. It's free for you to join. I pay for the platform so that we can join together as an artist community without any ads and without any algorithms. And I would love for you to join us over there. I'm gonna go pop this painting into my shop in my fine arts website so that you could buy it if you would like to have this painting for your very own. And I hope you will join me on Art Venture. I will see you guys later. Go create something every day.